Hey everybody, it's been a while since I've done one of these, hasn't it? Yeah, sorry about that, real life just keeps getting in the damn way, but I'm finally back to talk about Blade Runner 2049. This was directed by Denis Villeneuve, I hope I'm at least close on that pronunciation, you know how I am with name pronunciation, and stars Ryan Gosling and Harrison Ford. This movie takes place 30 years after the original Blade Runner, and Replicants had been outlawed for a time until this guy named Neander Wallace, who was played by Jared Leto, bought up the remains of the Tyrell Corporation and managed to convince the powers that be that Replicants should be legal again. Because humanity never fucking learns. Ever. But somehow he convinced the government that he could make replicants that were 100% obedient, and thus wouldn't even need a built-in expiration date. Wouldn't matter. I'm sure I don't have to tell you that this does not last. There are still some renegade replicants out there in the world, and our titular Blade Runner, played by Ryan Gosling, is a replicant himself, hunting down his own kind. And for a while, he seems perfectly fine with this, but eventually he starts to question his place in the world after he encounters something that should be impossible, and he goes on a quest to seek the truth. I suppose I should start out by at least briefly talking about the original, which I did not see when it first came out, mainly because I was a toddler at the time. I first saw it when I was well into adulthood, when I just bought the Final Cut Collector's Edition on a whim, and I think the Final Cut is the first version I ended up watching, mainly because it's the first disc in that set, and... I didn't really see what all the fuss was about. I didn't hate it or anything, I thought it was okay, but that was it. Just okay. But I was kind of curious to see how the film had evolved over time from the original North American theatrical cut, I should say, until the final cut that is apparently Ridley Scott's definitive version. So I thought, what the hell, I paid for this thing, I might as well watch it. So I went through the North American theatrical cuts and the international theatrical cuts and the director's cut, which, as I understand it, is kind of a misnomer, and then eventually came back to the final cut, and by that point, I had a whole different opinion about this movie. I was totally into it, and I couldn't really figure out why I wasn't totally into it the first time I had watched it. And with that, I totally get how this movie bombed when it initially hit theaters, but found a new following many years later, because that was kind of my experience as well. And the original theatrical cut with that god-awful narration from Harrison Ford and that bullshit happy ending that was studio-mandated, yeah, I can see how that would not have done well. But yeah, I'm still not sure why I just wasn't feeling it the first time I watched it. Maybe I just wasn't in the right frame of mind at the time? I mean, that's entirely possible. I've had that experience before. Uh, and not just with movies, I've had it with music as well. I'll buy a CD and play it once and think, eh, I don't know why my friends were talking this up so much. This is just, eh, whatever. And then a few months later, I'll come back to it just because, and then it'll be on a loop in my car for like three weeks straight. I'm like, why did I not like this the first time? It happens. And that brings us to Blade Runner 2049, an unnecessary sequel if ever there was one. And when I first saw the trailers for this, I thought, this can't go well. It just, it absolutely can't. I don't think anyone was really clamoring for this. Just, no, let it die. But then the early reviews started trickling out, and they were overwhelmingly positive. So I thought, well, maybe there might be something to this. So I gave it a watch, and yeah, I thought it was fantastic. This was really, really well done. Villeneuve did a great job of telling a brand new story in this Blade Runner universe while still staying true to the spirit of the original. The movie definitely has some of the same themes, a similar visual style, similar soundtrack, and it feels like the exact same world just 30 years later, and... Villeneuve clearly made a decision to not try to update it based on the real world of 2017. We still have the flying cars and the off-world colonies and advertisements for companies that are no longer around. Like, there's an advertisement for Pan Am Airlines. That's gone. There's an advertisement for Atari, which is 
technically still around, but in name only. It's based on 2019 as imagined in 1982. The film moves at a very deliberate pace, as you might have guessed from its two hour, 45 minute runtime. Don't get the large soda. And there are a lot of lingering shots in this movie. Villeneuve loves lingering. But I say deliberate and not slow, because it definitely did not feel slow. I was never bored, I was never looking at my watch thinking, oh my god, when is this going to end? No, it was no slower than it had to be. And there are quite a few twists and turns in this story to keep you engaged. And just when you think you figured it out, nope, red herring. They do a really good job of keeping you guessing, although they do drop a few hints if you're paying attention. Ryan Gosling's character doesn't really have a name to speak of. He's just known by a serial number, or he's affectionately known as K, or Skin Job. And he was a very interesting character. He's a replicant hunting down his own kind, which it was kind of hinted at in the original that Harrison Ford's character Deckard might have been doing the same thing because it was always a possibility. Maybe he's a replicant, maybe he's not, who knows? In this version, we know he's a replicant and he's even told he's a replicant. There's no mystery there at all. They even tell him straight out that he's been given false memories as a way of keeping him sane and helping him to blend into human society. But despite working for the good guys, he is still treated like a second-class citizen, even by his fellow officers, because those replicants keep taking her jobs! And a big part of the society in Blade Runner is this separation of the humans and replicants in this caste system of sorts. And as Robin Wright's character says, the world is built on a wall that separates kind. And if you tell either side there is no wall, you've got a war. His only companion is Joy, played by Ana de Armas, who is a hologrammatic AI. And much like Kay, the movie constantly questions whether or not she should be considered real, because while she doesn't have an actual physical body, she does seem to have real thoughts and emotions and genuinely seems to love Kay. But there's always that question of whether this is actually real or if it's just part of her programming. As far as Jared Leto is concerned, if any of you are tired of him, and I totally understand that, he's not in very much of the movie. He does his job, and in all fairness, he does it pretty well, and then he gets the fuck out of the way. As far as the villains are concerned, more focus is put on his bodyguard love, played by Sylvia Hoax. And I would say the movie is much better off for it, because she was pretty awesome and a total badass. And of course, Harrison Ford is back, and definitely putting forth one of his better efforts here. You can always tell when he is actually invested in the story, and he's definitely invested here, far more than he was in the original. And just for the record, it is still up in the air whether he's actually a replicant or not. He may be, he may not be, the movie doesn't really answer that question. They also use some CGI to recreate Sean Young's character Rachel from the original, and did a much better job than Star Wars Rogue One did with Tarkin and Leia. Though I was a bit confused by the way they portrayed the relationship between Rachel and Deckard, because they seem to be suggesting that this was a true loving romance, and that's not what I got out of the original at all. I mean, in their love scene, he forces himself on her. That's not romance. That's the other word that starts with R. Yeah. Overall, I think this movie really understood the original Blade Runner, but that was one aspect where I thought they completely missed the boat. Still, this was incredibly well done and I enjoyed it very much. But it will be interesting to see if I enjoy it as much on repeat viewings now that I know exactly what's going to happen and I'm not going to be surprised by anything. Will it still hold up when I know all the twists ahead of time? We'll see. I would recommend checking this one out, but again, skip the large soda. Also, you can skip the 3D. I saw this in 3D and I don't think it added all that much, honestly. And that's all I got to say about Blade Runner 2049. Till next time, take care.